Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome the audience, and I want to welcome our C-SPAN viewers who are tuning in. Uh, I am Peter Russo. I'm the Director of Congressional Affairs at the Cato Institute, and I want to thank you all for coming today. This is a Capitol Hill briefing entitled Fall Fables and Fallacies, the Truth About Policing in America. Before we begin, I'll remind you, if you'd like to join the conversation, we'd love to hear from you. So please tweet us at hashtag Cato Events. Uh, today we're resuming a multi-part Hill briefing series that will examine a number of policy areas of particular interest to lawmakers as well as to the electorate at large. The series is entitled Fall Fables and Fallacies, and over the next couple months we'll try and set the record straight on a number of issues and attempt to dispel the prevalent misunderstandings that are, in our view, adversely influencing public policy discussions. Last month we looked at economic and income inequality, and in the next several weeks we'll address free trade, U.S. foreign policy, and more. But today we will explore the state of policing in America. The recent events in Oklahoma and North Carolina provide a stark reminder that these law enforcement issues that so dominate headlines and broadcast leads need to be carefully and soberly examined and addressed. To do that, I brought together the principal members of Cato's project on criminal justice. This effort has become a leading voice in support of the Bill of Rights and Civil Liberties. It is led by the director, Tim Lynch, whose research interests include the war on terror, overcriminalization, the drug war, the militarization of police tactics, and gun control. Since joining Cato in 1991, Lynch has published articles in a variety of periodicals and law journals, and he has appeared on innumerable public affairs programs. He has also filed several amicus briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court in cases involving constitutional rights. He blogs extensively at the Cato Institute's National Police Misconduct Reporting Project, found at policemisconduct.net, a site I wholly recommend. He is also the editor of In the Name of Justice, leading experts re-examine the classic article, The Aims of the Criminal Law, and After Prohibition, an adult approach to drug policies in the 21st century. Lynch is a member of the Wisconsin, District of Columbia, and Supreme Court bars. He earned both a BS and a JD from Marquette University. Uh, Jonathan Blanks is a research associate and the managing editor of the aforementioned policemisconduct.net. His research is focused on law enforcement practices, overcriminalization, and civil liberties. Blanks, too, has also appeared on various television, radio, and internet media, including HuffPost Live and Voice of America. His work has been published widely and most recently in the Case Western Reserve Law Review with an excellent piece entitled Thin Blue Lies, How Pretextual Stops Undermine Police Legitimacy. Uh, we did have copies available on the outside table, but I'm told we are now out of them. But if you do want a copy, uh, send me an email or to contact me after, and I'm happy to get one for you. Um, Blanks is a graduate of Indiana University. Then we'll have Adam Bates, who is a policy analyst at the project. His research interests include constitutional law, the war on drugs, the war on terror, and police militarization. Bates received a BA in political science from the University of Miami and both an MA in Middle Eastern Studies and a JD from the University of Michigan. He is a member of the Oklahoma Bar. And finally, we'll hear from Matthew Feeney, who is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute. Before coming to Cato, Matthew worked at Reason Magazine as assistant editor of Reason.com. He has also worked at the American Conservative, the Liberal Democrats, and the Institute of Economic Affairs. Matthew received both his BA and MA in philosophy from the University of Reading in England. Uh, we will do a usual format today. Each uh, speaker will have about 10 minutes or so, and then at the end, we will open it up to audience questions. Uh, to help set the stage, let's please welcome Tim Lynch. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, right now, I think it's safe to say that American policing is being discussed and debated like never before. Uh, to take just one example, the Washington Post uh, some months ago earned a Pulitzer Prize for tracking fatal police shootings across the country. It's really astonishing when you think about it, of all the things the government keeps track of, uh, it never kept an accurate tally of fatal officer-involved uh, shootings. So that's why the Post uh, earned its award for throwing resources and trying to come up with an accurate number for everybody so we can put police shootings in some kind of context. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying the same? Recent surveys also show that citizen confidence in the police has dropped to its lowest point in more than 20 years. This, so this afternoon, what we want to do is offer our ideas on how policing can be improved. But before we get into a discussion of specific reform ideas, we thought it would be useful to start off with an overview of policing in the United States. So once we have some perspective on the big picture, 
then we can get to some concrete reform proposals. Law enforcement in America is heavily decentralized. We have federal police agencies and we have state and local police departments. Everybody here knows about the major federal law enforcement agencies like the FBI, the Secret Service, the DEA, and the Border Patrol. But there are dozens and dozens of smaller federal agencies that have police powers. I'm talking about the Bureau of Land Management. There's a Federal Reserve Police. And we discovered another one recently, the US Government Publishing Office Police. Uh, if you go to their website, you'll see that their agents are, are armed with automatic weapons. So there's dozens and dozens of federal agencies out there with police powers. And even though the number of federal police agents has been growing by leaps and bounds over the past 30 years, most of the policing in the United States is done at the state and local level. We have about 18,000 police departments spread across 50 state jurisdictions and we have about 800,000 sworn officers. A sworn officer is someone who is authorized to make arrests and carry firearms. On the federal level, there are about 150,000 sworn officers. Now, sometimes people ask me why Cato would bring its police reform ideas to Capitol Hill when most of the action is taking place at the local level, at the county level, at the city level. It's a fair question. Uh, there are several responses to that. The first one is that policing issues, some policing issues apply to both federal agents and local police agents. Uh, back to uh, police shootings, most of the controversial shootings that we've seen on the news over the past two or three years, uh, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Laquan McDonald, these are shootings involving local police officers. <coughs> But just yesterday, the Supreme Court announced that it is going to be reviewing a case involving a Border Patrol agent who shot an unarmed 15-year-old Mexican boy. So federal agents do get into controversial shootings, and the Supreme Court is going to be taking up that case this term. Second, the relationship between the federal government and local policing has become rather complicated over the years. Uh, Adam Bates is going to explain how the Department of Defense has been sending military weaponry and equipment to our local civilian police departments. Congress also sends millions and millions of dollars in assistance to local police departments with various rules and regulations that come attached to those funds. Matthew Feeney is going to be discussing body cameras in that context. Uh, body cameras is a subject that Hillary Clinton has been talking about on the campaign trail when criminal just justice issues come up. And John Blanks is going to be touching on how federal and state police work together in the context of civil asset forfeiture in a program called Equitable Sharing. The Department of Justice has also been called in to investigate many local police departments uh, to see whether or not there is a so-called pattern and practice of constitutional violations. Over the past few years, the Department of Justice has been called into cities such as New Orleans, Cleveland, Newark, Miami, Albuquerque, Oakland, Ferguson, and recently they issued their report on the Baltimore City Police Department. And a federal investigation is now underway in the city of Chicago where federal investigators are looking into that department for a pattern and practice of constitutional violations. We expect a report on that to come out anywhere in the next uh, four to six months. We're also seeing the federal government get more directly involved in prosecuting local law enforcement agencies, or agents, I should say. Just yesterday, uh, the famous sheriff in Arizona, uh, Joe Arpaio, has been uh, cited for criminal contempt uh, by federal uh, officials. Uh, he's going to be going on trial, it looks like, in just a few months, and there's a possibility that he'll actually face jail time. It's a remote possibility, but he's going to be prosecuted in federal court, and that is a possibility. And the former sheriff of Los Angeles County, Lee Baca, is also under federal indictment. So there's a lot going on. I should also note here at the beginning that we are aware that when a police department is performing well, when it is maintaining high standards of professionalism and gets good reviews from the community, that's not considered to be news. 
uh, it doesn't get as much in the way of a lot of media attention. So we, we do recognize that. But at the same time, we also have to face the reality that many departments are beset with serious problems. And what we want to do is identify constructive policy proposals that can help to minimize those problems. So that's just a quick overview of uh, policing in the United States. My colleagues uh, will now dive into some of the more specific proposals we're offering in the way of reform. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and interest in this subject. Good afternoon. Um, I want to talk today about something most of us have gone through in one point or another, and that is the mundane traffic stop. When that comes to mind, most people think, oh, you know, oh, crap, I got, I got busted. I was going 65 and a 55. You sit there, you wait for the cop to come up, and you're just thinking, oh, I don't really want a ticket. Can I get out of this? And it's just like, that's how you go about it. That's the, that's the peak of your concern. But that's not how all traffic stops go in this country, particularly for uh, minorities. There's a different type, kind of traffic stop known as an investigatory stop. And this can happen any number of ways. An officer can follow you for a while as you're going through a neighborhood. Um, and you're just wondering, and he's, it's been a mile, two miles, following closely, and you're like, what's going on? And uh, finally, his lights pop on, and he pulls you over. And uh, he, he comes up to the car, and you're like, officer, what did I do wrong? He's like, well, that little light above your uh, license plate, it's, it's out. Or you, you swerved a little close to the yellow line. But you're thinking, I've been aware of you for the past three miles. I know I didn't go near the line, but there you are. And uh, so as you're waiting for your license and registration uh, to him to run it, you're nervous. And when he returns, instead of just handing you the ticket or giving you the pass, he immediately starts asking questions about why you're there and what are you doing. And you realize that he doesn't really care about the, uh, the light above your license plate. He, he's running an investigation. And he's going to try very hard for you to give up your right to not be searched. Um, he can use all kinds of trickery. He can, pre he can pressure you. He can say, you know, you're just going to make it easier on yourself if you just give me the consent. Uh, it's not about, you know, we can bring the cane out, out here. We're going to search you anyway, so you might as well just make it easy on yourself. Now, here you are. You've done nothing wrong, and you have a police officer sort of implicitly threatening you for doing nothing wrong at all. And you know the names Philando Castile and Sandra Bland, and you know this can get really ugly, maybe even fatal. So you consent, and you sit on the side of the road, sometimes in handcuffs, and cars drive by as, car, as police officers rummage through all your things. And to all the world, you look like a criminal. And you're being humiliated. The officer find, may find nothing. He'll send you on your way, maybe with a warning. No apologies. And in your mind, this isn't like a speeding ticket where you know you got busted. You, you know you did wrong. <coughs> this, this was illegitimate. And you're just wondering, that's not what to serve and protect is supposed to mean. And the stop was done under pretext. The entire reason for the stop was he thought you looked suspicious. And chances are he thought you looked suspicious because you had black or brown skin. We all realize, we all realize that curbing dangerous driving is an, an important police function. But you know, when you get a ticket for speeding, you don't like it, but it's not really a problem. But when you have these pretextual stops that cause um, antagonistic interactions with the police, that's, that has shockwaves that goes through a community. The, there are studies that show that one in, th what, one in three black men between 18 and 35 have gone through this exact thing, and even more know people who have, who have gone through it. That resonates, and that erodes police legitimacy in that community, and that actually makes uh, law enforcement harder. It makes, the police less, it makes the community less safe because criminals feel emboldened because this contributes to the animosity between the minority communities and the police themselves. So you may be wondering, why am I talking about this on Capitol Hill? There's really nothing more local than being pulled over in your, uh, in your neighborhood. Well, as Tim alluded to, uh, the equitable sharing program uh, is part of the DOJ's uh, incentive program to get, people, to get police officers to enforce the war on drugs. And part of this is 
uh, known as civil asset forfeiture. It, it's when a police agency can seize property that is tangentially tied to a crime. Now, you don't have to be charged with a crime. You certainly don't have to be convicted of a crime for them to take it. And unlike criminal forfeiture, where there needs to be a conviction, the, in civil asset forfeiture, you have to go into court and prove that that money is legitimate. And that's often very expensive and very uh, time consuming. A lot of people don't have it. And the way this works is if this officer was never, not a traffic cop at all and like part of a federal task force, he was there in order to look for drug trafficking. And one of the perverse incentives of this, because the police department gets to keep 80% of whatever cash that they seize, uh, is that instead of stopping drugs and guns, we have police officers on tape saying, oh no, we get them coming out of the major metro areas because they're going to be cash laden. And they can seize that to pay for overtime, to buy new toys that Adam will talk about. And it just becomes this very nasty policing for profit uh, motive. So what we, what we have is a perverse incentive on a couple different levels. Um, again, we're not, if the police are incentivized to stop the cash, but not the drugs and the guns, then what exactly is the war on drugs for anyway? Is this, it's supposed to be a public safety issue, right? But if it's just to make police officers more money, that's not helpful. I'm not saying that every police officer who goes through this is a bad person or that, you know, that they don't care about what happens uh, in the communities, but their incentives are all wrong, and Congress can make these little changes to diminish this and perhaps improve uh, the relationship between these communities and the police. Thank you. How's it going? Thanks for spending your lunch listening to me drone about the police. Uh, but as, as Tim and John both mentioned, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the, the militarization of police and to show how that uh, dovetails with, uh, with the, the federal involvement that, that John mentioned. Uh, so to carry on the theme of the federal government providing perverse incentives to state and local law enforcement, uh, yeah, I want to talk about the, the militarization of our police over the past uh, few decades. So I think we all, we all saw the images in Ferguson of, of the police with gas masks and body armor and assault rifles, in some cases sniper rifles. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, a lot of people, especially people in communities like Ferguson, they, they are familiar with this uh, image of American law enforcement. But I think for a lot of people, uh, people like me, I, especially, this, this was a bit of a shock. Uh, you start to think, is this what law enforcement is, looks like in America right now? Uh, so there's a longstanding myth in America that, that SWAT teams and these paramilitary tactics are isolated incidents or that they're reserved uh, for the worst of the worst. And in fairness, that's how SWAT teams started. Uh, SWAT teams were initially designed uh, to be used for hostage situations, <laughs> active shooters, uh, barricaded suspects, things of that nature. Uh, emergencies where routine law enforcement equipment and tactics uh, were not good enough. Uh, but with the uh, advent of the drug war, that, that changed rapidly. A few hundred SWAT raids a year turned into thousands. Uh, the best estimate we have right now is that police across America conduct how many raids do you think police conduct? Just in your head, how many SWAT raids do you think uh, go on in this country every year? Uh, the best information we have right now is that roughly 80,000 SWAT raids occur uh, in America per year. Uh, and contra contrary to conventional wisdom, again, these are not hostage situations. These are not active shooters. The vast majority of these SWAT raids are serving search warrants. Uh, only 7%, according to the ACLU, only 7% of these raids are those initial purposes, the hostage situation, the active shooter situation. Uh, the vast majority of these are search warrants, and the vast majority of these search warrants are looking for drugs. Just recently, you may have seen in the news, a SWAT team in Massachusetts, reportedly accompanied by a National Guard helicopter, uh, descended on the home of an 81-year-old woman in order to seize a single pot plant that had been spotted uh, from the air. Uh, so, and that woman is fighting with all of her heart, bless her. <laughs> uh, 
and so, and, I, so he, and people need to understand these are not these are not peaceful law enforcement operations. They've become a bit normalized, uh, but we're talking about aggressive paramilitary style raids, and they're dangerous. They're dangerous for the officers involved, and they're dangerous for the people who live in these homes. So we're talking about showing up at your house at three in the morning, three or four in the morning, and in many cases not even knocking on the door to announce themselves, battering ram in the door, throw everybody on the floor, shoot the dog, perhaps. Just a side note, how many dogs do you think the police kill in this country every year? Uh, the Department of Justice, this is shocking, the Department of Justice estimates that police in America kill 10,000 dogs uh, a year during, during these police procedures. Uh, so again, these are high intensity uh, with a high potential for violent escalation and a high potential for violence. So what does this have to do with, with you and your bosses and the federal government? Well, that's another myth, that the federal government does not have much to say about what goes on in, in local police departments. Uh, while criminal justice is historically uh, a state or local practice, uh, the war on drugs and more recently the war on terror have provided the basis for the federal government to become deeply entangled in state and local law enforcement. Uh, and that, that the result of that entanglement is a big distortion of police priorities and police practices. So through huge federal grant programs such as the Urban Areas Security Initiative, through weapons transfer programs directly from the Pentagon transferring weapons and military weapons and military equipment to local police uh, through programs such as the 1033 program that many of you are familiar with uh, and through the aforementioned uh, equitable sharing program that is the federal government uh, creating a legal regime to help facilitate state and local police uh, taking property cash and property from people uh, who are not charged with a crime or not convicted of a crime they're merely suspected uh, usually of a drug crime uh, losing their property to the police. Uh, the federal government through this program provides incentives for state and local police to engage in this. And so the end result of this is that state and local police, because of the incentive structure, start to forsake local concerns and local priorities uh, in the name of fighting the federal government's wars, the federal government's war on drugs and the federal government's war uh, on terror. Some examples of, of this distortion. Uh, police in Keene, New Hampshire applied for and received federal funding, almost a half million dollars, for a mine resistant vehicle by arguing that the Keene Pumpkin Festival was a target for terrorists. I'm sure it's a fantastic pumpkin festival. I've not been myself, but I, it, it, it stands to reason that, that the Keene Pumpkin Festival was not actually an Al Qaeda target. And in fact, a Keene city councilman admitted as much when he said, we're not really concerned about the threat of terrorism, but that's what you have to put on the application if you want the money. Uh, another refreshing bit of candor from the same official said, and by the way, what red-blooded American cop doesn't want to drive around in one of those? That's surely true. It's surely true that police and anyone would like to play around with these toys, but that is not the purpose of law enforcement. That is certainly not the reason, uh, reason that justifies the existence of these federal programs or this federal intervention in state and local police. Another councilman called it a tremendous waste of money, which was also candid. The important thing to remember, because these are federal grant programs, it was not the money of the taxpayers of Keene, New Hampshire. This did not go through the Keene legislature. This did not go through the normal appropriations process. This was money from the federal taxpayers, from the federal government to Keene in order to, to provide this equipment that otherwise uh, they simply wouldn't have because nobody else would be paying for it. Uh, another example, police in Tacoma, Washington decided the threat of IEDs. Uh, IED stands for improvised explosive device. These are the kind of roadside bombs that you may hear about in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so Tacoma, Washington cited the threat of IEDs to, uh, for federal funding for another mine resistant vehicle. Again, there is very little evidence that there has ever been or will be in the near future an IED attack in Tacoma, Washington. But that's what you have to say if you want the equipment. Uh, retired Senator Tom Coburn from my home state of Oklahoma uh, put out a report in 2012 uh, to highlight the, the profligacy of these terrorism grant programs. He specifically targeted the Urban Area Security Initiative, uh, which at the time, this, this study was put out in 2012, had given more than $7 billion to state and local law enforcement through these terrorism grants, and yet, uh, according to the report, 
there was very little evidence to suggest that the communities were any safer, that this massive expenditure of federal tax dollars and this massive intervention of the federal government into state and local policing was actually producing anything on the back end, except for enriching these departments and producing this militarization effect. Uh, President Obama commissioned a task force after the events in Ferguson to, to explore the 1033 program and other weapons transfer programs, and they concluded that there was not adequate training, there were not adequate concerns about civil rights, and in fact, uh, per the recommendations of this task force, uh, the 1033 program was actually reformed so that police were no longer giving t given tanks or tracked vehicles, so still vehicles with wheels they can still get, but nothing on tank treads. Uh, they could no longer have weaponized aircraft, they could no longer have rifles larger than 50 caliber, they could no longer have grenade launchers, and for the love of God, they could no longer have bayonets. And I, I, I still to this day have not found out why the federal government was giving local police bayonets or, or whether they were ever actually deployed, but no longer. So we're, we're eschewing the local concerns here and the local priorities because when this funding comes through the equitable sharing program, when it comes through these federal grant programs, you're not going through the normal process. You're not going through the representative process and finding out what the community needs and what the community wants. You are getting your incentives and your mandates from the federal government instead. Uh, I do want to say I don't just want to, to rip on uh, abuses of this program, uh, some police departments, to their credit, have rejected participation in these programs for exactly that reason. So Brandon Del Pozo is the chief of police in Burlington, Vermont. He voluntarily removed his department from the 1033 program and said, I do not like the way my officers seeing things through a military lens. This does not look like law enforcement to me. This looks like military and that's not what uh, we want police in this community to be about. So there are, this is not just us up here saying this, there are people in the police community out on the street saying this is not what law enforcement should look like and we don't want to take part in this anymore. So from equitable sharing to terrorism and drug war funding to outright military equipment transfers uh, to the secretive transfer of uh, invasive surveillance equipment such as Stingray cell phone trackers and some of the things uh, so things such as drones that my colleague Matthew has written about. Uh, the federal government has forcefully injected itself into everyday policing. And the priorities, tactics, and most importantly, the legitimacy of law enforcement has suffered greatly in this country as a result. So the federal government may not be able to solve all of the problems with policing in America, but it can stop exacerbating the ones that we have. Uh, some departments will have this equipment regardless. Some of the, your bigger uh, cities will have police departments that have well-equipped SWAT teams, mine resistant vehicles, things of that nature, because they can go through their local appropriations process, they can go to their community and convince them that they need this equipment. But places like Key, New Hampshire, and all of these, uh, I can say it because I'm from there, podunk little towns in, in Oklahoma and middle America will not have mine resistant vehicles if they are forced to pay for it through the local process instead of getting uh, what one police officer called pennies from heaven uh, to, to pay for this equipment from uh, the federal tax budget. So that's why, I, that's why the federal government does have a role to play here despite the uh, history of, of criminal justice being a state and local issue. Uh, now I'll turn it over to my colleague Matthew Feeney. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this has been very cheery so far, hasn't it? Uh, I hope to. Um, so I hope to, to follow on uh, from what uh, Adam and John have been speaking about to discuss police body cameras and the role that the federal government uh, is playing in body cameras and also their costs and benefits. I see. If you're on the right side of the room, you might be regretting that you're not in view of uh, the, my my great PowerPoint presentation. But I assure you, it's. Mostly, uh, there won't be too much that's uh, informative. It's mostly pictures, so you don't have to stare at me for the entirety of uh, the talk. But I thought it would be important to begin by discussing a town that John and Adam and Tim will mentioned, which is Ferguson. And many of you will know that uh, in November 2014, a St. Louis uh, County Grand Jury declined to indict Ferguson, Missouri, police officer Darren Wilson for the killing of Michael Brown. And Brown's killing sparked protests all across the country. And in the wake of uh, the, the news that Wilson would not be facing charges, the Obama administration proposed a $75 million, three-year, 50% matching funding program for the purchase of 50,000 body cameras. 
And this isn't a surprise. Body cameras have been a staple in police misconduct discussions. There's a widespread belief that they prompt some kind of observer effect, that people behave better when they know that they're on, under observation, whether you're a citizen or a police officer. And indeed, there is some evidence to back this up. The most, um, the most uh, widely cited study on this took place in Rialto, California. And a new police chief came in and he outfitted his officers with body cameras. And they recorded use of force incidents and complaints against the police and compared uh, that number to the years before the body cameras. And what they found is that in the year when body cameras were deployed, there was a dramatic reduction in use of force incidents and complaints against the police. A more recent study that was published uh, last month examined 4,200 officer shifts in seven sites. This was about 1.5 million hours worth. Uh, of body camera footage. And they compared, again, at the year before and the year of body cameras. And they found a 93% reduction in citizen complaints against the police. Uh, there are a number of reasons why it might be so dramatic. Uh, for one, I think this study required officers to inform citizens that they were on camera uh, before the interaction took place. Uh, I don't want it to paint too rosy a picture. Not all the studies have found uh, as dramatic results. Here are. Uh, results from San Diego, uh, they found in the year when body cameras were used, or the time period when body cameras were used, there was actually an increase in use of force. Uh, the, although there was a decline in what's called greater controlling use of force incidents, so those are uh, tasers, pepper sprays, and things like that. But the only benefits might not be on the behavior of police and citizens. Body camera footage and other footage have proven very valuable in investigations into police misconduct. So many of you will be aware of the uh, the Walter Scott shooting that took place in North Charleston, South Carolina. The officer involved, Michael Slager, is, uh, will have a murder trial, which is starting at the end of this month. Er uh, the Aragona killing was uh, captured uh, on cell phone footage, although the officer involved in that was uh, not charged. And when it comes to body cameras, I'm sure many of you will be aware of the Samuel DeBose shooting, which took place in Cincinnati. Ray Tensing, the officer involved there, is facing murder and voluntary manslaughter charges, and his trial will begin at the end of this month. The prosecutor in that case described the body camera footage as invaluable in bringing charges. This piece of footage, uh, this is from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is uh, the killing of James Boyd. He was a homeless, paranoid schizophrenic who was camping out in the uh, foothills of the San Andrea Mountains. And it was actually announced yesterday that the second degree murder charges, uh, the, the, the trial here ended in a mistrial. Uh, this was announced yesterday. But the district attorney, when this began, said that we have evidence in this case to establish probable cause we didn't have in other cases. So there seems to be uh, pretty good evidence that body cameras have some beneficial effect on officers and citizens, although to what degree it's affecting citizens more than police officers, I think, remains to be seen. And it's certainly the case that body cameras have, been, have proven very useful in investigations into police misconduct. But I think it's also worth us thinking about the costs here. Uh, police regularly interact with people who are drunk, high, mentally ill. They talk to children who have been sexually assaulted. They are first on the scene at many accidents, they talk to informants and undercover agents. So when we're considering a body camera policy, we really do have to be careful about the privacy concerns associated. Uh, I've taken some pictures from body camera footage to highlight some of this. Uh, the top left, that's a, a man stabbing a police officer. In the bottom left, it's a man undergoing a drug overdose in his car. Uh, the top right and bottom right pieces of footage show a SWAT raid that took place in Indiana. And I'm, I'm highlighting these uh, these uh, screenshots because they give, I think, a good idea about what police are seeing. The, the SWAT raid footage is particularly, I think, disturbing because you're seeing the interior of someone's home. You can tell a lot about someone by what they watch on television or what's on their bookshelves and in uh, you know, political posters, religious uh, icons, things like that. Uh, the man in the, in the car is not a violent criminal or anything. He's undergoing a medical trauma, yet uh, I found that very easily on YouTube. The, the man stabbing the officer, well, he, his face has been blurred, but he still has rather distinctive tattoos. It wouldn't be that difficult if you knew the jurisdiction to figure out who that man was. And in light of these concerns, I, I wrote a paper for Cato uh, highlighting what I think the right uh, policy should be so we can get this balance right between accountability uh, and privacy. I think that the important thing is that incidents that take place in private homes, that, that body camera footage should not be 
uh, available to members of the public. It should be available to the homeowner, their attorney, or their next of kin, but not anyone to request. Uh, I don't have the same view about incidents that take place in public. If you don't have an expectation of privacy and the officer doesn't, I think members of the public should be able to see body camera footage that shows searches, shootings, and detentions. Now, today we've been discussing that, of course, law enforcement is primarily a state and local issue, but uh, I think there is an important role here for the federal government. As I mentioned earlier, the Obama administration shortly after Ferguson uh, indicated a strong interest in body cameras. And body cameras aren't cheap. They impose a bit of a fiscal burden on a lot of departments, and the Department of Justice has issued body camera grants. But what I want to stress today is that the Department of Justice has issued body camera grants to departments that do not have good policies in place, that do not promote accountability or transparency. Uh, in 2015, the Department of Justice gave $23 million in body camera grants to 73 departments in 32 states. The Los Angeles Police Department was one of these departments. It received $1 million, despite the fact that the Los Angeles uh, policy requires police officers under investigation to view body camera footage before they make statements. Uh, and the policy also did not explicitly uh, have prohibitions on using body camera footage for general surveillance. This year, there was $20 million awarded to 106 departments in 32 states. And one of the states uh, where these departments were is uh, North Carolina. And many of you will, I'm sure, have followed the news out of Charlotte and have heard something about the law on the books now in North Carolina, which prevents members of the public like you and me to access body camera footage absent uh, without, a, without a court order. These, this is not a policy that promotes accountability or transparency. And I think if the federal government is going to be involved in funding body cameras, the very least it can do is ensure that money only goes to departments that have demonstrated a commitment to transparency and accountability while also protecting privacy. And I'll finish uh, very quickly with uh, this note. Uh, body cameras are just a tool. They're not good or bad in virtue of their existence. They're made uh, good or bad tools by the rules that govern them. And with the right tools in place, they really are great tools for accountability and transparency as the Samuel DeBose uh, shooting, I think, highlights. But we shouldn't forget that uh, without the right policies in place, they're a rather terrifying tool of government surveillance. And there is a number of things on the horizon that I, I want us all to keep in mind. Very few departments have policies explicitly banning the use of facial recognition software on police body camera footage. Uh, the, it's also very important that departments have policies in place that limit the access that officers have to body camera footage. We don't want uh, police deciding in their spare time to sit down and trolling through body camera footage to see who was where doing what, especially if there's no probable cause. That all said, I am a long-term optimist when it comes to these tools, but I, I do worry about the federal government's role, uh, the policies that it is adhering to, uh, but ultimately, it's up to people who work uh, up here on Capitol Hill to ensure that those strict policies are put in place. Thank you.